Hello, everybody, and welcome to the session called Phonetics One, Part One. Uh, we have three talks in this session. Uh, we're handling a question and answer in the chat. Uh, so when the talk is finished, please um, uh, feel free to ask a question in the chat. Uh, the title of our first talk is uh, called Identifying the Correlations Between the Lexical Semantics and Phonology of Sign Languages, a Vector Space Approach. Uh, there are uh, multiple authors that are available uh, uh, after the talk to um, uh, participate in the Q&A. Um, Emery Hagwader is giving the talk and with him are Aurora Martinez Del Rio, Casey Ferrara, Sang Hee Kim, and uh, Diane Brentari. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, so in this presentation, we hope to bring forth a new dimension into the longstanding discussion about whether or not form and meaning in human language are related. Uh, we try to achieve this by studying two unrelated sign languages with uh, the help of uh, computational methods and a data driven approach. Um, so form to function mapping is not necessarily arbitrary. We see this in spoken languages to some extent and in sign languages to, to a greater degree. Uh, the Saussurean concept of uh, arbitrariness of the sign may be ill-informed. Uh, sign languages systematically transform visually iconic material into meaningful linguistic units, by, but iconicity is not immediately transparent. It can stay hidden in the uh, subcomponents of the phonology. Uh, also, iconicity is not the only motivator behind uh, phonological similarity. Uh, so like I, I said, uh, sign languages have decomposable phonological parts. Uh, these are hand shape, location, movement, and orientation. Uh, but note here, please, that these subcomponents of the visual, uh, visual art articulatory system are very different from those we, we find in spoken languages. And uh, by using computational methods, we can map phonology onto lexical semantics in a way that allows comparison between the two. I'm sorry to interrupt you. Hi, For sure. I'm the interpreter. I just came out of another session and you're just, and I just need to get set up for a moment, please. Okay, uh, so what should you expect to find in this presentation? I will first briefly present a high level background on uh, semantic vector spaces, and then jump straight into how we built our models and present analyses and findings and, and then finish with uh, what's still hanging and the results that, that our study shows. Um, so the main question that we seek to answer is how is phonology distributed across the lexicon? So what phonological parameters are shared within clusters of semantically related signs and which ones have a distinctive function? Does any of the phonology come for free? Uh, more specifically, does iconicity or the visual modality facilitate any of these processes? Um, similar studies have been carried out in the past, but only in focused and uh, small pockets of semantically related uh, spoken or signed words. Uh, but can we study the entire lexicon of a language using quantifiable methods? And also additionally, what we're not trying to achieve is a comparison between uh, spoken and sign languages. The phonological system, systems are, are not easily comparable if, if they are at all. Uh, so we combine phonological transcriptions and semantic vector embeddings of uh, two unrelated sign languages and look for correlations. Uh, this will allow us to make uh, cross-linguistic generalizations and maybe even extend them into the visual modality. Uh, the language that we said, study are American Sign Language, ASL, and British Sign Language, BSL. And we hypothesize that decrease in semantic, uh, in semantic distance correlates with increase in phonological similarity. So signs that are closer in meaning will share certain phonological features. Um, here, is a, uh, here are some visual examples for you that de demonstrate what we mean. Uh, these are three signs in American Sign Language that can be semantically grouped together as verbs of, uh, of cognition. Uh, so this is the sign for think. This is the sign for know. And finally, the sign for um, dream. So all three signs share the same place of articulation, which is around the temple, and they differ in their movement and handshake specifications. 
we can loosely argue that the semantic notion cognition corresponds to the phonological specification around the head. Uh, before moving further, a little background on uh, vector space models, if, if you're not familiar with them. Uh, so distributional semantics says that words that occur in similar contexts must be semantically similar. So consider the representation below. We can par paradigmatically replace each word with a semantically salient substitute. So then we can assume to a degree that the meanings of all these alter alternatives should be related in the human lexicon. Um, and words can be represented mathematically as high dimensional vectors. Uh, here is a uh, impressionistic representation, re representation of vector spaces. They usually have uh, large numbers of dimensions, usually in the low to mid hundreds. I'm sorry, and I'm going to have to stop you again because- For sure. Especially this is about sign language. This is becoming on really hard to interpret. Also, usually deaf participants prefer to have just the video of the interpreter and also the presenter, because then you can hide the non-video participants and just see the interpreter, the presenter, and the slides. And I see. This, this presentation started a little bit before five o'clock and the interpreters weren't ready. Um, so I sorry have, to interrupt your I have you and Emery spotlighted, so they should only see you too. Oh, okay. My yeah. view is different. So, and there was, a, there was some chat about not being able to see the interpreter. So I thought that was the issue. Okay, then okay. Uh, I will just have you spotlighted. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't see the chat and I, I wasn't aware. Are, are you okay now? Good to go? Thank you. For sure. Um, so words can be represented mathematically as high dimensional vectors, like I said, uh, and here's a, an impressionistic representation of vector spaces. Uh, they usually have large numbers of dimensions, uh, usually uh, in the low to mid hundreds. And these dimensions are obtained from the frequency of how words occur in each other's contexts. Uh, so this example has only three dimensions to help you see it easily. It basically shows that think and know are closer in the semantic space than think an animal are. So uh, vector representations have been used in computational semantics for decades. Uh, these are very data hungry models and their quality depends on the size of the training corpus. Uh, we'll present results from models trained on corpora with as many as uh, 900 billion tokens and uh, with as little as 15,000 tokens. Um, so here is our, this is what our pipeline looks like. First, we have our phonological and semantic raw data. Then we intersect the two and work on the over, overlap, which is around uh, 2000 uh, tokens, depending on the portion of the lexicon that we're studying. And uh, after certain transformations, we build our um, mo models with respect to certain parameters and finally uh, analyze each of them. Um, we use a version of uh, Brentari's prosodic model uh, with uh, 42 phonological uh, features uh, that belong to different uh, parameters, uh, parameters of phonology. Uh, for ASL, we use uh, annotated phonological transcriptions of the Gallaudet Dictionary. And for BSL, we use transcriptions from the BSL uh, for the BSL sign bank. Um, for lexical semantics, we have two sources. Uh, first, we use uh, pre-trained English vector embeddings uh, from GLOVE. You might be asking yourselves why we use uh, English vectors to study ASL when the languages are not related. Uh, but the answer is because theoretically, regardless of the language of the corpus, the training process will wash out structural relations and uh, what we're left uh, with will be very similar semantic spaces across languages. We do this because uh, neither ASL nor BSL uh, has large enough corpora to train a, a reliable vector space model. Excuse me. Uh, that said, we wanted to replicate our findings using native ASL data. Uh, we did that with uh, BU's ASL corpus. Uh, this is a word by word uh, manually annotated corpus of uh, conversations uh, from which we created our own vector embeddings. Uh, ask me about this if you like. Uh, just keep in mind that this is this is a small corpus for this purpose, and we ended up with uh, vector embeddings with uh, questionable uh, quality. 
Um, we trained many models with uh, different parameters. I won't go over the details, but some of these parameters relate to the architecture of the model, while some have to do with uh, semantics and other uh, factors. Um, we have two types of analysis. Uh, pairwise analysis finds unique signs, uh, unique sign pairs within the entire lexicon. Clustering analysis, on the other hand, first groups the lexicon into separate clusters and then pairwise uh, and then finds pairwise combinations within each each cluster. In both analyses, we use cosine and Euclidean distance to measure uh, semantic similarity. And for phonological similarity, we go over each feature and see if they match between the two signs. Um, these two types of analysis give uh, different insights into sign language, language phonologies, uh, but the clustering method is more suitable for capturing the, nu the nuances that we're after. So uh, imagine that we have a vocabulary composed of just nine words. Uh, we would first identify the 36 unordered sign pairs uh, in, in this corpus and then calculate semantic and uh, phonological similarity within each pair. Um, we calculate some, uh, phonological similarity both as a whole and also uh, separated by phonological parameters that, that I just to uh, told you about movement, hand shape, location. Um, so pairwise analysis finds a statistically significant but low correlation. Uh, so what you see on the x-axis is uh, phonological similarity and the y-axis is uh, semantic similarity. The regression line is positively sloped, but only a little. Uh, you can see on the top right, husband and wife. Um, so these are two semantically very close uh, signs and they're phonologically also very similar in, in ASL. On the bottom left, you can see animal and recline, but semantically, uh, these are semantically very distant and also phonologically very dissimilar, which, which is great. But we also have uh, many pairs such as Denmark and Sweden, uh, which are semantically very close, but phonologically very distinct. And also pa uh, pairs such as certify and little, which are semantically very distant, but phonologically very sim similar. So what gives? This seems like we're not on the right track. Um, but turns out this is expected because pairwise analysis um, ignores semantic organization and takes the lexicon as a whole. So uh, we know that phonology needs to be econo economical and adequately distinctive. So uh, simply, simply there isn't enough phonological material available to the uh, articulatory system to mark all meaning distinctions. And even if there were, that would be very infeasible for uh, language production and perception. The lack of a linear correspondence shows that the phonological patterns are distributed arbitrarily and that sign language phonology systematically re reuse material in unrelated uh, semantic contexts where they would be uh, distinctive as you would expect from, uh, from a natural language. Also, we first need to establish what we mean by semantic similarity because there are types of, uh, there are many different types of uh, semantic relatedness such as synonymy, uh, topical relations. So this is where uh, the clustering analysis comes to our help. Uh, so we used Ward's hierarchical clustering method to train 120 models per language, where each model has a different number of clusters depending on certain parameters, which again, I will skip. Ask me about these later if you like. Um, There we go. Uh, suppose that we have the same nine word vector space. This time we group the lexicon into separate clusters. For, so we have university and college together, language, vocabulary, and grammar together, and the, the, the four here together. Um, and, then, and then what we do is measure semantic distance and phonological sim similarity within these clusters. Um, also what we find is the sum of distances within each cluster. So we sum these distances and this tells us how close the, the members of the cluster are in the semantic space. So let's first look at a, uh, an example model from ASL that you see on the left. Uh, phonological similarity is again on the x-axis and sum of distances this time sem semantic similarity is on the y-axis and each, each of these uh, points, each of these circles correspond to a, a semantic cluster. So uh, we see that phonological similarity correspond, 
correlates meaningfully with semantic distance as semantic distance in the cluster decreases, phonological similarity increases. The correlation is a lot more pro pronounced in, in the BSL vector space that you can see here on the right. So now let's look at uh, phonological components uh, separated. Um, uh, we see that in this BSL vector space, um, oh, uh, location is the most shared parameter across clusters, while handshape and movement. Can are you the please least hold the switch for interpreters, please? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, uh, here we go. Okay, uh, so we divided the data by uh, phonological components this time. And uh, in BSL, we see that location is the most shared parameter and handshape and movement are the least shared ones. In ASL, handshape similarity correlates the highest with semantic distance followed by location and movement. So uh, the take home message is the phonological parameters are utilized differently between the two languages in the same semantic space. So we extracted the correlation coefficients for each model. Again, ASL is on the left and BSL is on the right. Uh, lighter color means stronger correlation. And we can see from the coloring that ASL has a more diffuse distribution of co coefficients compared to BSL. And both languages display a, similar, uh, a stronger correlation between form and meaning when we train the model on the Wikipedia corpus, which is uh, the, the red box that you see here. And uh, we trained a five-way ANOVA to see which parameters explain the greatest uh, variance in ASL and BSL and found that the type of the training data and its number of dimensions are responsible for explaining the biggest portion. What this means is that we capture the correlations better depending on the source data and how it is uh, semantically organized. Um, so semantic distance is a significant indicator of phonological similarity in sign languages, and the two have a strong correlation when the lexicon is organized in certain ways. Uh, phonological features are not equally utilized. Taking into account the entirety of our models, we see that movement tends to be shared more, while handshape is, is the most salient uh, phonemic component of the phonology, uh, meaning it's the most distinctive parameter. Um, so can we uh, project phonology onto semantic space visually? Uh, yes, we can do it with TISNI, which is an algorithm that squishes a high dimensional space and projects it onto a low dimensional one for, while preserving the majority of the relations. Also, what is, what is the, the advantage of this? And uh, let's see. So what you're looking at is the entirety of the ASL semantic space on the left and uh, BSL on the right. The colors encode the most salient distinctive component of the phonology for each cluster. Blue encodes handshape, red is location and gray is movement. Uh, for instance, in this cluster, uh, which is bound together semantically by the notion of royalty, uh, we have uh, king, crown, prince, princess, and whatnot. And these signs are distinguished by different handship configurations within their cluster, while the rest of their forms remain mostly the same. We go to another cluster, um, so fruits, which are right here, and we see that the most distinctive feature that sets them apart is location, while handshape and movement parameters overlap to a certain degree. Um, another thing in ASL that strike, uh, strikes us here is the vertical distribution of the red and the blue circles. Uh, it looks like red, which is the location parameter, is more prevalent on the top portion, while blue, which is the handshape parameter, is more uh, prominent in the bottom. Uh, when we look at the signs, we see that the red signs are more tangible concepts, such as fruit names, objects, weather, phenomena, while the blue lines are more intangible ones, uh, such as names of sports, titles, uh, functional signs also, and a lot of verbs. So we believe that this comp compartmentalization might be a general effect of how the phonology digests iconicity into the system. When we look at BSL, uh, we see that handshape is a lot more distinctive than location and movement, but we don't see a separation of semantic, semantic topography like we do in ASL. 
Um, here we go. So, and finally, this heat map shows the results from our models uh, that we trained on native ASL data. Each cell is a model. Uh, the lighter the color, the higher the phonological similarity. Uh, to our knowledge, there's no gold standard as of now to measure the quality of these vector spaces for sign languages, but notice the rising trend as we go from left to right, it, it, it becomes uh, brighter. Uh, and this overlaps with the observations on the architectural parameters in the literature that are associated with higher quality vector embeddings. So this tells us that phonological similarity increases systematically as we organize the semantic space of ASL with higher, with higher accuracy. Um, so um, in the future, we plan to test the psycholinguistic reality of the, uh, of the distinctiveness of the phonological components by obtaining human judgments. We also plan to find ways to identify accurately what semantic relations we're capturing. How am I doing with time? Oh, okay, great. Um, and um, all right, uh, we have shown that decreasing semantic distance means increasing phonological similarity and that high quality semantic organization is a precursor to capturing this phenomenon. We have also sh shown that this is not a, a phenomenon constrained, constrained to just a few corners of the lexicon. It is a general trend across the board with varying degrees of magnitude, uh, at least in the two sign languages that, that the two sign languages that we study. Uh, one needs to dive deeper into the subcomponents of phonology and uh, then we'll, we can uh, extract the similarities. Handshape and location are the most dis distinctive phonological parameters in ASL and BSL. The visual modality seems, seems to bring with it movement at a low cost. The lexicon uses iconicity and its linguistic extensions, extensions to the language's advantage. Uh, but this is not to say that sign languages, uh, sign language phonologies are not systematic. They, they most certainly are. Additionally, we have shown that sign language phonologies behave differently cross-linguistically. And uh, finally, pairwise analysis has shown that phonology is arbitrary and has a limited amount of material available to encode uh, meaning differences and that uh, it distributes those resources economically. On the other hand, clustering analysis shows that uh, when we organize sign lexicons uh, in, uh, in certain ways, the correlations between phonological and semantic similarity uh, get stronger. Uh, and that said, uh, while semantic proximity is a highly significant indicator of phonological similarity, it is not the only factor since we're not able to fit the entire lexicon of a language neatly on a regression line. And uh, thank you very much for listening. Great, thank you so much uh, for that talk. Um, we still have uh, uh, seven minutes uh, left for questions. Um, if people have questions, you can uh, put them in the chat or you can just say, I have a question in the chat and raise your hand and then I can unmute you and you can ask uh, your question. All right. So uh, Omri, while we're waiting for uh, questions to come in, could I ask a question? Mm -hmm. uh, Please so, go ahead. so I was just wondering, uh, given the distributional semantics uh, approach to the lexical semantics, whether co-articulation um, would work its way into the semantic analysis. So co-articulation between adjacent signs. Oh, articulation between adjacent signs. Um, are you talking about simultaneity of signs or? Yeah, um, well, uh, I, the way that the signs are coded, does that factor out co-articulation or could that work its way into the distributional semantics? Uh, I believe it, actually, this is one of the questions that we uh, had in the beginning, but we just like had to find a way around uh, co-articulation. Um, the problem is I'm not the phonologist here. I'm pretty sure somebody else from my, um, from the group can answer this better. But yes. Okay, well, we, we, we have some, um, some other uh, uh, yeah. questions coming in as well. Um, uh, so we could- So move. yeah. I can, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. So Amelia Becker's question, did you control for morphological similarity 
Uh, we did not control for anything, actually. We just uh, used the vector spaces and uh, with different parameters, we believe we did, we captured different uh, relations. Uh, for example, you mentioned for logical symmetry between wife and husband, both these signs are derived from compounds with the sign Mary. Uh, how can we distinguish between phonological and morphological uh, similarity? Um, this is a great question, and uh, the short answer is uh, we are not distinguishing between phonological and morphological similarity. Um, we are only uh, looking at signs as, uh, as having phonological subcomponents, uh, leaving morphology aside for now. Um, could you explain a bit more, uh, this is Albert's question, a bit more what it means to say that hand shape and location are more distinctive than motion in these languages. Um, so it seems like um, it, these subcomponents, these parameters of the phonology are not equal. Uh, it seems like when we go to these clusters of signs, uh, we find a lot of overlap in movement, but we don't, we don't find a lot of overlap, for instance, in handshape. So what this means is in these uh, isolated pockets of semantic similarity, uh, we, find, we find very similar signs, but they minimally differ in handshape more than they differ in movement. Uh, and second to handshape is location. And it seems like at least in ASL, uh, handshape and location have, uh, have uh, different duties. Hope this answers. Yes, please, Diane. Can people hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So um, to answer the question about co-articulation and the semantic space, uh, these analyses were done on um, isolated signs. So the dictionary, the Gallaudet dictionary is just that, a dictionary, and so is the BSL sign bank. Um, it's isolated signs. So in order to answer that question, we would want to compare the same signs from the dictionary in a, a large corpus such as um, the Nidal corpus, which was uh, a, a corpus of, of conversations and uh, sentence sentence contexts. Uh, we'd have to do that kind of comparison. My prediction would be that you're going to lose some of the semantic uh, clustering when you get into the uh, connected corpora. I think co-articulation, if I'm gonna go out on a limb, is gonna be more driven by perception and production um, from the phonological side than from the semantic side, but that's just a very, very kind of speculative prediction. Thank you very much. Uh, um, we still have uh, two more minutes. So if there's another uh, relatively uh, quick question, we could take, uh, take one more. I wish people could just jump in instead of chatting, putting them in the chat. Okay, going once, going twice. You could also, um, participants can also raise their hand to ask a question and then we can um, unmute um, a participant whose hand is raised. I don't see any. Okay, going once, going twice. Okay, let's um, let's thank our presenters for an excellent talk. Thank you. And our next talk will start in one minute at five thirty. Uh, sorry, <laughs> five thirty for me, two thirty for other people, many other <laughs> so two two thirty Pacific time.
Okay, so let's, uh, let's now begin the second talk of the session. Uh, the title is uh, Children Do Not Uniformly Compensate for Their Changing Vocal Track Anatomies. Uh, and it will be presented by uh, Meg Chihosh and Keith Johnson. Hi, can everyone hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Hopefully you can see uh, the slides and not notes. If you see notes, let me know. That means I didn't share my screen correctly. Um, my name is Meg Sikosh and this is joint work with Keith Johnson. So today I'll be talking about how, how children do not uniformly compensate for their changing vocal tract anatomies. Okay, so vocal tract length differs by speaker gender, height, and age. To contend with this variability between speakers, we usually apply vocal tract length normalization functions that remove these anatomical differences and allow us to isolate differences that might be due to sociolinguistic or psycholinguistic factors. But for children, Vocal tract length normalization might not be so straightforward. So children's vocal tracts are, of course, shorter than adult vocal tracts, but their morphology also differs from adult vocal tracts. So the ratio between the oral to pharyngeal cavity is that changes over the course of children's typical development. So in infancy, the oral cavity is much longer relative to the pharyngeal cavity <clears throat> and the pharyngeal cavity gradually lengthens as children age. So children's vocal tracts, they also grow non-linearly, meaning that at any given age, the ratio between the cavities is unpredictable. Now, the different oral to pharyngeal cavity ratios between adults and children is going to affect the frequencies generated from those cavities. If children want to match the acoustics of adult models, they would have to compensate for their vocal tract morphologies. And this is not a new idea. As early as 1966, Gunnar Font suggested that compensation could be a source of variation in child speech. One way that children could compensate for their morphologies is to shift their lingual constriction into a more anterior position in the vocal tract. And that has the effect of artificially lengthening the pharyngeal cavity and approximates the oral to pharyngeal cavity ratios and thus ratio between resonant frequencies that adults have. And there's some evidence that children may do this. So there's two studies that I'm aware of, Maynard and all in 2007, had four and eight-year-olds produce real vowels, and then they compared those vowel productions to two simulations. One was an articulatory simulation, so they, they were um, uh, childlike uh, simulations, and the other one was uh, acoustic or adult-like target simulations. And then they compared those two simulations to the children's real vowels, and they found that the children's vowels matched the acoustic simulations better than the articulatory ones, as if the children were articulating like an adult. Um, and that suggests that the children are compensating by shifting their tongues. And I'm just gonna take one second because something popped up in the chat and I wanna make sure it's not from an interpreter. Um, sorry, I just wanted to, I'm just trying to make sure that the interpreter uh, can communicate with me. Um, Turner et al. Uh, also looked at this and uh, performed an acoustic analysis of children's vowels. Uh, they constructed a mathematical model that showed that phone identity and vocal tract length together explained about 98% of formant frequency variance. And so what that suggested is that anything internal to the vocal tract, any of those developmental changes, those are really kind of statistically meaningless is what they concluded. So here we're going to ask a similar 
question, do children compensate for their vocal tract morphologies? And we're gonna use three novel analyses to answer the question. So we ask, do children compensate for their vocal tract anatomies by shifting the location of lingual constriction? And we are also interested in how much children compensate. And so we ask, do all children compensate uniformly? So previous work hasn't ever evaluated variability between children in the degree of their compensation, but child speech is highly variable. So we predict that some children might compensate more than others. So first I'll talk about the data set you use to answer these questions. So the data for this study come from a corpus of 86 children aged four through 10. These children were all bilingual speakers of Quechua and Spanish. Uh, these VAL data were collected and cleaned for a different research project. So none of these research questions interact with the languages that these children speak. Um, and in fact, we, we really don't have any reason to think that the results would differ for any other language study. And so this was just a, a convenience corpus to use for this question. The VAL data were elicited in a real word repetition task that targeted the peripheral vowels, E, A, and U, and the vowel always fell in stressed word medial position. And of course, it's pretty well known that it's difficult to reliably track formants in children's speech. So a triple formant tracker was built running three different trackers and the median formant measurement was taken from that tracker and then used for the analysis. And there were some additional kind of manual form and cleaning procedures that I can talk about in the Q&A if you're interested. So to estimate how well the children were compensating, we had to get two anatomical measurements. We had to get vocal tract length and we had to get the size of the oral and pharyngeal cavities. Vocal tract length was computed standardly from the acoustic vowel formants and here are the results of the vocal tract length estimation. This is pretty standard stuff. Here we're looking at child age on the y-axis and vocal tract length on the x-axis. And again, pretty standard calculation. So unsurprisingly, we see that the average vocal tract length increases with child age. So this is a good sanity check. And then next, we had to estimate the oral to pharyngeal cavity ratio. So cavity ratio was inferred by comparing the frequencies of back and front cavity affiliated formants during the production of a neutral vowel uh, in this case. But uh, children's different vocal, given their different vocal tract morphologies are kind of typical assumptions about formant cavity affiliations, which are normed on adult male vocal tracts may not apply to children. Uh, but fortunately, remember that we aren't actually interested in the length of the oral or pharyngeal cavities. We only care about the ratio between the cavities. So to circumvent the whole formant cavity affiliation issue, we instead just calculate the ratio of F1 to F2 during the production of a neutral vowel. So using this ratio technique, uh, the prediction is that a smaller ratio of F1 to F2, that's gonna indicate that the child was compensating more by shifting their lingual position and a larger F1 to F2 ratio is gonna indicate that the child was compensating less. And so in this way, even if the affiliated cavity changes between children, between tokens, um, we can still approximate the size of the children's cavities and thus how much the children are compensating by shifting their lingual position. So now getting to the results. So three analyses were conducted. The first one is modeling the impact of the F1 to F2 ratio and how and if and how it can explain variance in children's vowel production. So mixed effects modeling was used to evaluate the ability of the F1 to F2 ratio to explain variance in the children's formant frequencies. And two models were fit, one for F1 and one for F2. Unsurprisingly, phone identity explains a large amount of variability between and within children. Vocal track length does too. 
Um, and this was estimated as discussed on one of the previous slides. This also explained a large amount of variability between children, but above and beyond these more expected sources of variation, we additionally found a significant effect of the F1 to F2 ratio, how likely children were to shift their lingual position. Um, and that predicted formant frequency variability both in the F1 model and the F2 model. And so this suggested to us that some children were compensating more than others. So after fitting the models, the next step was to dive a bit deeper into the results by individual children. So we next conducted a median split over the children on the basis of their F1 to F2 ratio during ah production. This graph shows the results of that. Um, the children's age is now plotted on the x-axis and the ratio between the first two formant frequencies is plotted on the y-axis. In the left panel are the children who had the lower half of the F1 to F2 ratios and we've classified them as more adult-like articulators. And then on the right are the children with the higher F1 to F2 ratios who we've classified as the more childlike articulators who aren't necessarily compensating by shifting their uh, location of lingual constriction. The adult-like articulators in purple, they get better at compensating as they age. So with that F1 to F2 ratio decreasing, but you don't see any uh, linear relationship like that apparent in the childlike articulators. And that kind of suggests that maybe those children haven't yet established reliable compensatory strategies. And overall, these results offer us just a little bit more evidence, again, suggesting that, okay, so there's some individual variability. Some children are compensating, um, but not all children are compensating equally for their anatomies. Some do it more and get better with age as we would expect, while others don't yet have an established strategy. The final analysis that we conducted was to compare two different formant frequency scaling techniques one vowel extrinsic and one vowel intrinsic to evaluate the question of children's compensation in one additional way. So there are numerous formulae to remove between speaker anatomical differences for acoustic analysis, but they fall into two overarching categories. You have non-uniform where the formula takes into account specific vowels and formants during scaling and uniform where the formula applies one scaling factor, usually vocal tract length or a correlate uniformly to all vowels and formants regardless of identity. So we're going to compare one non-uniform scaling method, the Lobanoff technique, and one uniform scaling method, the Delta F technique. The reason for comparing uniform and non-uniform scaling methods is to compare how much between speaker variability we can remove by simply factoring out vocal tract length. That's what the Delta F method does, and comparing it to a technique that includes information about not just vocal tract length and cavity size, but also individual vowels, um, we can then compare the resulting frequencies across these two scaling techniques. And if the scaled Lobanov frequencies differ from the scaled delta F frequencies, this suggests that factoring out vocal tract length alone, that's not enough to remove between child differences between vowel normas for, during vowel normalization because there are additional sources of variability between children. So we scale each child's formant frequencies first using the Lobanov technique and the del then the Delta F technique. And on these plots, um, each facet represents one of the child age groups. And what we want to do next is to take each speaker's individual vowel category from each technique and then calculate the difference between the average Lobanoff scale value for that vowel and the average delta F scaled value for that vowel. And here we're plotting that difference between Lobanoff scaled and delta F scaled frequencies on the y axis. And it's again by child age on the x axis. And the facets are again the more adult like articulators on the left and the more childlike articulators on the right. And the first thing you should notice is that there's a positive difference between scaling techniques. So that means that, yes, indeed, there is outstanding between child variance after factoring out vocal track length. 
Second, looking at the adult-like articulators, there is a smaller difference. I'm looking to see if the interpreters are getting ready to change. So I'm gonna stop until they're able to do that. Is it okay if I continue? Okay, um, where was I? So then looking at the adult-like articulators, there's a smaller difference between Lobanov and Delta F scaled results in the older age groups. So the older children are, the less outstanding variability there is in their speech that's not attributable just to vocal tract length. But we don't necessarily see that same linear decrease with age in the childlike articulator group. So I'm gonna wrap up. To sum up the results, we performed three analyses to analyze whether children compensate for their vocal tract anatomies. In the first analysis, we fit models demonstrating that the ratio between cavities explains additional formant frequency variants beyond phone identity and vocal tract length. In the second analysis, we performed a median split over the children and showed that the more adult-like articulators, they got better at compensating with age. And then finally, in the third analysis, we scaled the formants in two different ways and showed that there was outstanding variation when using non-uniform formant scaling. So answering the original research questions, we first asked if children compensated for their vocal tract anatomies by shifting the location of lingual constriction, uh, which we inferred in the three analyses we just summarized. And overall, the data suggests that yes, children do compensate for their vocal tract anatomies by adjusting the position of lingual constriction. And then next we asked, okay, so if children do compensate, do they do so uniformly? And the answer according to these analyses was that no, some children appeared to compensate more than others. Older children appeared to compensate more than younger, but there were still even some 10 year olds who had the same oral to pharyngeal cavity size ratios as the youngest children. And this signals to us that compensation, it might not develop linearly. So for example, maybe those older children, maybe they just experienced a growth spurt, for example. Now, at the beginning of this talk, I said that the two previous studies on this topic found that children did compensate for their vocal tract anatomies, but the results here suggest that that might not always be the case. But these results aren't really necessarily at odds with those studies. Remember that we found that children compensate, we just think that there are individual differences. Also, we believe that the differences between this study and that of the Turner study at least could have to do with the formant cavity assumptions made in that study. Turner et al. assumed formant cavity affiliations based off of adult male vocal tracts, most likely Peter Latifoyed, but our tech Techniques circumvented this issue entirely because we use the ratio of F1 to F2. So it's just important to remember that many of the assumptions that we have in acoustic phonetics, they come from norms based off of adults and cisgender male adults at that, and so may not always apply to other populations. And just a few implications for a few areas in child speech development. Um, first, child speech is characterized by large amounts of variability. And the results here suggest that the degree of vocal tract morphology compensation could be a source of some of that variability. And then also traditional normalization methods um, that only factor out vocal tract length between adults. That's usually sufficient for adult normalization, even though there actually are tract internal differences by gender and adults. But vocal tract length normalization alone probably isn't sufficient to normalize between children. You probably need to factor in the degree of compensation as well. Um, there are a few next steps that this research could take. Um, we could look at the different ways that children uh, compensate. So shifting their tongue constriction loca location is just one common strategy. Um, studying populations that have different visual experiences could be a good way to analyze this. So for example, there's evidence that children who are blind lower their oral cavity affiliated um, uh, their round for round vowel production um, by shifting their tongue and not by elongating their lips as sighted children do. And then we also think that there may be some individual variability in the extent to which children compensate. And so we should probably explore what predicts 
that variability. So it could be children who practice speech more. It could be exposure maybe to more diverse speech models. It could be if you have fewer growth spurts or if those growth spurts are more linear. Those are all interesting lines for future research. So thank you so much for your attention to this talk. Um, I've listed my contact information here and all the code and analyses are publicly available. I wanna thank the families who participated and also Ron Sprouse who um, developed the Python uh, ESPS wrapper that was used for the format tracker. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Uh, we've got um, uh, plenty of time for questions. Uh, let's see, some coming into the chat already. Uh, so uh, Will Styler uh, says, great talk. I'm fascinated by the adult-like versus child-like speaker variation. Did you look for or notice any social or demographic correlates of this difference besides age? No, I haven't looked at any other predictors yet besides age. Um, I, I think in this case, I'm not sure that there would be many social predictors. I would think that it would be that anatomical differences would be the thing that would explain the most differences between the groups. So like I said, like the regularity of growth spurts, the frequency of them when the last growth spurt was, all those things are going to affect the ability of children to, to kind of fall back on the articulatory schemata that they already have established. If you just had a growth spurt, you've got to figure out a new place to put your tongue in your mouth to get the right ratios. Will, did you want to follow up on that um, uh, with some, did you have a specific um, kind of social or demographic factor in mind? Uh, so the corpus was Spanish uh, Quechua bilinguals, right? So something like language dominance or exposure type factors. I wonder if that's what Will had in mind. Yeah, that, and that that's uh, that's that's possible, um, especially because the vowels were elicited in real words. They were elicited in Quechua words. So um, I have a talk on Sunday that talks about uh, exposure effects, not with this outcome variable. It's exposure effects on. Um, uh, phonetic patterning in morphologically complex words, but it would be interesting. I could do the same analysis to see if the degree of compensation in Quechua vowels is based on the children's uh, proportion of exposure to Quechua. That'd be really interesting. Um, another question uh, in the chat from uh, Andrew Cheng uh, says, hi Meg. Uh, did I notice that boys in your sample had longer vocal tracts than girls as they aged? Yeah, sexual dimorphism, at least in North American samples, um, happens uh, anatomically, doesn't necessarily appear like if you just took like a measuring tape uh, and measured uh, boys and girls vocal tract lengths, it doesn't typically appear until maybe like eight. But in the acoustics, it appears as young as four. So basically children are acting out um, gender by lowering the larynx and elongating the lips. Um, so even if you had a boy and a girl matched for vocal track length in, in North American samples, the uh, boy would appear to have a longer vocal tract because he's acting out gender. Um, I have no way of knowing if that is uh, similar in Bolivia. It could be that the boys and girls that I sampled in this, the girls, really did happen to have shorter vocal tracks, like the four and five-year-olds, for example, so. Uh, other questions? Um, I, I was kind of, uh, I might ask a question, if that's okay. Um, I was kind of wondering, so back, I, I, might, I might have just missed this, but back at the mixed models, um, uh, so did you explore interactions? So I guess what I was wondering if compensation could occur for some vowels and not others. Yeah, that's a really good question actually. Um, and of course you might anticipate that it would be more difficult to 
Um, I wouldn't, I, if I had to make a guess out of the three peripheral valves that it would be most difficult to compensate for valves that have like a Helmholtz resonator because the cavity affiliation is going to be um, changing. So um, that's a really good point. And actually, I don't think that we looked at that. So that would be a good thing to explore. Thank you. We still have um, a couple minutes before the next talk has to start. So if there's any questions, um, uh, please put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, otherwise, I could keep asking questions. Like you could tell us um, how much fun it is to track formants in, in children's speech. And <laughs> um, I should also say that my co-author, Keith, is here. If you have a particular question for him, he um, uh, in, uh, developed upon the Delta F technique. So that's um, really his uh, contribution to the study. Hi, Keith. Um, tracking formants in children's voices is awful. It's worse the younger they are. <laughs> um, the manual cleaning, so even doing a triple formant tracker, um, I, there was still an extensive manual cleaning procedure, just looking at like the distribution of vowels by uh, formant and throwing out things that were just wacky. Uh, so it's not a light undertaking. So really, really think if your research question, if you're working with child speech data, really think if vowels are the only way that you can analyze the question or if you could look at like fricatives or something else. Do that instead. <laughs> um, let's see, one more question coming through in the chat. Um, uh, have you looked at their development uh, in Spanish as well. Uh, uh, this would. Um... Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I have uh, language profiles for all of the kids. And then the way that I have been estimating their language dominance or their language exposure, their proportion of exposure to monolingual Spanish, monolingual Quechua, or um, uh, more code switched language, the proportion of code switching. I use day long audio recordings of the children and then I uh, annotate selected portions of those to get naturalistic estimates of the children's exposure to their two languages, the proportion of their exposure. And um, we have a just recently submitted paper you can find on my website that talks all about the technique for estimating children's uh, bilingual language dominance in this sample. All right, so there might be time for one more quick question. Um, it comes in soon. Otherwise, um, we should uh, thank our uh, thank our speakers. Some thanks coming into the chat uh, for the great talk, and um, uh, prepare for our uh, our next talk, which will happen in one and a half minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Just wanted to make sure you guys can see um, what I'm sharing. Yeah, it looks good. It's good. Okay. 
whenever you are ready, I can cue the video. Okay. Uh, so this is our, uh, the last talk of this uh, session, um, Phonetics 1, Part 1. Um, this talk is uh, recorded in advance, but the, um, the author, Elise Block, is, is here with us live and will be answering questions um, uh, after the talk. Uh, the title is uh, Q Weighting and Phoneme Specific, Specific Patterns in Systems of Quantity Contrast, the Case of Norwegian Vowels. Specific patterns in quantity contrasts, uh, taking a close look at Norwegian vowel quantity perception. So an outline of what we're going over today, uh, we'll start with a look at what quantity is and how it's realized cross-linguistically, and then continue on to an overview of some of the key theoretical concepts to consider when approaching um, analyzing phonological quantity. And then we'll move on to the meat of my presentation, the study on Norwegian vowels. And after that, we'll tie everything back together and take a look at what kinds of big pictures and big picture implications uh, data like those that I'll present have for our understanding of quantitative languages um, and maybe explore some possible explanations. So a good question to start with is what is phonological quantity anyway? Um, quantity is where segment duration encodes lexical distinctions. So whether a segment is long or short matters. And this is typically two way, so long and short, but in some cases, uh, we can have three or more distinctions, like in Estonian, where vowels can be short, long, or extra long. Um, both vowels and consonants can have quantity. You might be familiar with quantitative consonants called geminates. Um, and also quantitative segments often include some sort of compensatory effect on adjacent segments, um, typically like lengthening or shortening their duration. Some extensively documented examples of quantity include Italian, where we have long and short consonants, those geminates. Um, and additionally, we see that preceding vowels are often shorter before geminates, unlike um, the results of compensatory lengthening or shortening. Um, and we also have Japanese, which has long and short vowels um, with each quantity having a different pitch contour along with it. But if quantity is based on duration or duration alone, why do we care about secondary characteristics that come with these examples? Well, we can start with considering enhancement theory from Stevens and Kaiser. And it describes this idea that a contrast is often signaled by multiple acoustic cues with redundant or secondary cues serving to essentially enhance that contrast, making it more robust and salient for listeners. So for example, um, English has word final stop voicing as a contrast, and that has a redundant yet enhancing secondary cue of duration of the preceding vowel, right? We know that vowels are longer before voice stops than voiceless. Um, and this difference in duration is really helpful for listeners when hearing the difference between words like mat and mad. And cue weighting is then this idea that when we do have more than one acoustic cue signaling a contrast, each one has a weight or how much a listener relies on that cue to correctly identify a segment. And we can talk about cues um, as either primary or secondary. So primary cues are usually those that are like the hallmark of a contrast, like voice onset time for our um, aforementioned stop voicing contrast, while secondary cues are those enhancing ones, like the vowel duration I mentioned. Um, and relative cue weight, so how these weights relate to each other, they can change across communicative, communicative contexts, uh, speech style, dialects, and even individuals. So here we're setting up um, two main ideas that one, contrasts are often not signaled by a single lone acoustic cue, and two, when there are multiple acoustic cues, um, they have weights and they can even be, be ranked. But returning now to the language at hand, um, Norwegian. Uh, Norwegian has a two-way vowel quantity contrast. So they have long and short vowels. Um, and we see minimal pairs like tak with a long vowel, meaning roof, and tak with a short vowel, meaning thank you. Duration-wise, long vowels in Norwegian are typically 80% longer than short vowels. And secondary acoustic cues in quantity production include post-vocalic consonant duration, so consonants are shorter after long vowels. 
Um, and the secondary cue that we'll be focusing on today is vowel quality. So whether or not vowels have different qualities when they are long than when they're short. And the role of different vowel qualities across quantities, or even if there is one, has not always been crystal clear in the literature. Benny et al. in 1996 stated that vowel quantity did not affect vowel quality, only duration. While quantity is described in other places, such as Christofferson's book, The Phonology of Norwegian, as affecting quality, specifically that long vowels were more peripheral or closer to the edge of the vowel space than short vowels. And following that quality differences do exist between long and short vowels, what does this do for quantity perception? Nyland and Benny's 1996 paper concluded that Norwegian speakers don't really incorporate vowel quality when determining quantity, at least not strongly, and especially when compared to English speakers, as they concluded in their 2003 paper. So this leaves us at the conclusion that while we may acknowledge that there are quality differences between long and short vowels in production, we may seem have we may seem to have remained um, rather agnostic about if this is used in perception. Therefore, there are a couple questions I will be addressing today. So first, how do listeners integrate secondary acoustic cues, specifically vowel quality, um, into the perception of Norwegian vowel quantity? And is this perhaps phoneme specific? And with that, a larger question of how can the conclusions that we draw from this inform our understanding of phonological quantity and contrasts in general. So on to the current study. Um, so for this study, uh, stimuli were produced by a native Norwegian speaker recorded in the phonetics lab at UC Davis. He produced monosyllabic CVC non-word minimal pairs containing E, U, and A. Vowels were manipulated across two dimensions to make a 6 by 10 matrix as seen here on the right. The duration continuum went from 70 to 160 milliseconds in 10, um, 10 millisecond increments, so, so 10 steps, and the quality continuum had six steps. The first and last step were based on the F1 and F2 measurements of the long and short vowels as produced by the speaker, and the middle steps were made by changing the first two formants and equidistant steps, making a gradient transition from one quality to, to the other. So this created 60 versions of each vowel, so 10 durations and six qualities. And then after, the vowels were spliced back into their CVC frames and the post vocalic consonant duration um, was normalized to 110 milliseconds. So that was the average of, of after long and short vowels. 38 participants at the University of Oslo completed a forced choice pair discrimination task in Qualtrics, an online platform. Um, each trial contained two pairs of words. One pair contained the stimulus and the original production of the short vowel, while the other had the stimulus and the original long vowel. Participants were asked to listen and determine which pair contained the same or most similar word. Here, I'll play, a, I'll just play an example for you. Bid, 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 bid. So one more time. Bid, 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 bid. So in that example, the vowels in the first pair had different qualities, but the same duration, while those in the second pair had uh, different durations, but the same quality. Participant responses were coded as indicating either long or short vowel categorization, and the data was modeled with a mixed effects logistic regression model. The mixed effects of the model included the main effects of uh, quality and duration and their interaction, and random effects included by subject random intercepts and slopes for the main effects and their interactions. Um, and I ran a separate model for each vowel. There were two main predictions. Um, so first, given that quality is in fact reliably and systematically observed in the production of vowel quantity, um, we can predict that it will be a significant predictor in our model used by listeners to determine vowel quantity. Second, the use of quality um, in perception may or may not be vowel specific. We'll, we'll see. So here um, we can see that the model for E and U both showed quality as a significant predictor indicating that when perceiving the difference between long and short E and U, listeners used vowel quality as a cue. 
Interestingly, this was not the case for awe, where the model showed quality was not um, a significant predictor. In this case, listeners used only vowel duration. And we can take the estimated coefficients of our model to determine relative Q weights and from that um, Q order as well. So for A, we only had duration as a Q, um, so it's, it's duration. But for E, quality had a higher coefficient than duration, suggesting that listeners relied upon vowel quality more than vowel duration when differentiating between long and short E. Contrastively, in the U model, duration had a higher coefficient, suggesting the opposite that listeners relied on duration more than quality when determining quantity. So not only does it seem to be vowel specific whether listeners will use uh, vowel quality at all, but the Q ordering also seems to be vowel specific. And here we can see how the proportion of long vowels, so along the y-axis there, um, changes across duration steps on the x-axis for each quality step, which are indicated by the different colored lines. And we can see how this looks different for each vowel, especially a uh, and, and e. So just to uh, quickly summarize our findings here, there are two main points to be taken away from the data. So one, vowel quality is indeed used by listeners in the perception of Norwegian vowel quantity. However, we see an emergence of phoneme-specific patterning. High vowels e and u included vowel quality while the low vowel ah did not. And the Q ordering based on the estimated coefficients in our model differed between E and U. So what can we, what can we make of this? Well, the pattern of high vowels using quality differences in quantity distinctions is attested cross-linguistically. So uh, Maddie et al. in 2007 found that vowel quantity contrast in Hungarian has eroded somewhat with high vowels relying more heavily on quality differences than durational cues. In the case of Hungarian, which is a traditionally quantitative language, durational differences are also less robust in production, indicating that this quantitative system may be shifting to a quali qualitative quality-based system like in English. And a similar phenomenon is reported in Czech. Um, Podlipsky et al. in 2009, um, showed that high vowels were not showing the same degree of durational contrast, but rather shifting to um, a more qualitative contrast as well. Um, and the figure here from the Podlipsky paper shows a phonemic boundary between long and short vowels that is not completely vertical, which it would be if it was just based on duration, but rather diagonal, indicating both quality and duration are influential. Norwegian has not quite demonstrated this apparent erosion of durational differences in production, but the similarity in perceptual patterns is striking, particularly that like Hung Hungarian and Czech, uh, the high front vowel E model estimated quality to be weighted more heavily than duration. But the question still remains, why high vowels? Um, one possible explanation that was suggested to me is that ah, the low vowel is often produced with more variability than E. And this is because of the pressure that E has to not become a fricative. Um, and perhaps due to that variability, reliably using quality differences and quantity may not be advantageous and therefore does not occur. Another explanation could be that because the quality difference between long and short high vowels included height differences where the low vowel did not, um, it might be more salient for listeners. We know that uh, differences in lower frequencies, such as F1 differences for height, are often easier for listeners to perceive. Both of these possibilities should be explored further. Um, here I only offer them as ideas, not anything definitive. Um, and I invite anyone in the audience who might have an idea about this to share it during the, during the q and I'd really like to hear your take on this. But now how can we zoom out and consider how these data apply to the larger ideas that I brought up earlier? So the inclusion of multiple acoustic cues to signal quantity contrast is right in line with enhancement theory. Vowel quality differences enhance quantity differences, at least in high vowels. And uh, the fact that it is phoneme specific raises the question of if quality differences could be in the process of going from a redundant enhancing cue, perhaps an articulatory consequence, to being phon uh, phonologized in Norwegian. Nevertheless, uh, these data speak to the uh, true complexity 
of um, quantity as a phonemic contrast. And furthermore, these data show that cue weighting can be phoneme specific and cue ordering as well, even in the same communicative context. Um, and you know, how might this contribute to how we want to think about cue weighting moving forward? What should we consider now when we approach things like vowel contrast systems? So this study, um, as with any study, is of course not without limitations. So the first is that this study um, only examined a subset of the vowel system, so three vowels. Um, and it would really be worth it to look at the entire vowel system to get a more comprehensive account of how acoustic cues are used by listeners. Um, also, the fact that answers were binary did not allow for listeners to give answers such as, it does not sound like either, or sounds mostly long but kind of short, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and lastly, the study only looked at non-words. I think it would really be worth it to also examine real words and see if lexicality could also affect cute weighting. Will we see a difference between real words and non-words, for example? And this study is one part of a series of ongoing experiments that are making up my dissertation in which I will be taking many of those steps that I just mentioned and also looking closer at production and how it is linked with perception. I'm specifically looking at clear speech. Um, and this will be done with a year long research fellowship through the American Scandinavian Foundation for a 12 month stay at the University of Oslo. I'm really looking forward to uh, continuing that and looking more closely at these questions. But before I wrap up here, I'd really like to uh, thank um, Svera and the University of Oslo for hosting me and facilitating my data collection and say thank you to my advisor, Georgia, for her ongoing support and feedback in developing my research program. Uh, thank you for listening. And if you have any comments or questions, you can either bring it up in the Q&A or feel free to email me. All right, thank you very much. And um, I, I believe that uh, Elise is still here, right, to answer questions? Yes. I, okay, so um, uh, questions can be put in the chat window or hand can be raised, or you can just say, I have a question, and then um, I can call on you. Uh, yes, questions can be spoken, but you, ah, oh, there, okay. Let's see. Keith Johnson has his hand raised, hold on. Hey, Jason, I think I'm on. Oh, great. Yay. Uh, nice talk. Thank you very much for this. Um, I just had a small anecdote from a study that I did years and years ago where we asked listeners to adjust the vowel formants of a speech synthesizer. And I had a couple of listeners who spoke languages, uh, well, Serbian, um, where there's a length distinction but not a quality distinction. The synthesizer didn't give them length as an option. And so they, and I was asking about American English vowels. So the difference between heed and hid was not present uh, for those listeners. They adjusted the vowel formants of the synthesizer to exactly the same location. And so it's kind of um, converging evidence maybe for um, your concern or your, your question about uh, the weighting of cues where when given when the uh, duration cue was not available, these listeners uh, didn't use quality uh, as a, uh, a way to uh, uh, make the vowel difference. They just let them be the same. That's really, yeah, that, that's really interesting. I'm gonna have to do a little search and find that paper to, to take, a, take a little read at that. Thanks for bringing yeah, that up. Yeah, thanks. Do we have, oh, uh, Nina um, uh, has, a, has her hand up here. Uh, go ahead, Nina. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Elise. This was um, very interesting, very clear. Hi, Nina. Um, I, hey, <laughs> I, had, um, I had a question about the, the difference you found between E and U. Um, and I was, I was wondering if, could, could this be sort of um, reflected in or maybe be the result of differences in how they're produced. So differences in the correlates that they have. So maybe quality is used more for one or the other. Um, my impression is that we don't have that many very systematic studies of the uh, production of uh, quantity distinctions in Norwegian. So I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about this. 
Um, yeah, so that was actually exactly something that I kind of ran into when trying to do some background reading about this was that the production studies did seem to be a little all over the place. Um, my intuition, I guess when I hear it, is that I feel that the difference between long and short E is comparable, I guess, to long and short U, but of course, we can't just go off of our intuitions. Um, I do think that we might see a difference um, between E and U, and that could be something that plays into why people really, really like quality for long and short E. Um, I haven't seen or done anything quite yet with that, but I'm hoping um, with the dissertation that I'm doing, um, I'm going to be looking at production. So hopefully I can answer that question in one to three years. Great. Uh, we have time for other questions. Um, are there other questions out there? Um, Elise, I, I, I've got a question. Yes. I was just wondering, um, uh, do you, so I thought you were suggesting that maybe the system is uh, changing or not particularly stable. Um, is that is that your view? What what direction do, do do you see this as a possibly stable system or as unstable the way it's uh, uh, currently looks from your perception results? Um, so with my current study of three vowels, I feel um, making claims about the stability of the system is a little beyond my qualification, but. Um, I wouldn't say that it's not as that it's necessarily unstable as perhaps it's just maybe changing a little bit to start including quality differences. I don't think it's necessarily getting rid of duration differences, at least not at this point, like um, Hungarian and Czech seem to be doing. But of course, these processes take a long time. So there's no, you know, no reason to not say maybe in the future it could happen, but at least at this point in time. Um, yeah, I think they're just starting to include quality differences. Um, to a larger degree now. Thank you. Um, we have a question uh, coming from Rebecca Scarborough. Uh, Rebecca, do you want to ask your question uh, in person? Sure, I can. Um, can you hear me? Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Elise. Um, I just had a really quick question. Um, I, I jumped in um, partway through, so I might have missed something. But um, you mentioned at the end the limitation of the binary response. Um, you know, you couldn't say this was sort of long, sort of short. So I was wondering if you had looked at reaction times, if you had reaction times um, that might give you a way to look at these sort of intermediate type judgments. Yeah, um, unfortunately, with uh, the way I had done the experiment the first time, I was not able to get reaction times. Looking back, I wish I had, but um, when I'm gonna go back and look at like the larger vowel system, I do want to include reaction times, but also those binary answers or non-binary answers, I mean, sorry, with like the kind of middle middle um, responses as a possibility. Um, but yeah, unfortunately I don't have reaction times to look at at the moment. Sure, I think it would be super interesting in the future. Okay, the, the next question comes from uh, Alexandra uh, Pifner. Um, uh, Alexandra, do you want to ask your question out loud too? Hannah, can you hear me? Uh, you're a little quiet. Okay, let me see if I can fix that. Um, <laughs> thank you for this. I was wondering. Do you think the difference can be partially attributed to the fact that lower vowels tend to have longer durations? So if high vowels tend to be shorter, then maybe a quality difference can really help compensate for the overall shorter duration in order to convey a phonological contrast. That's an interesting, yeah, that's an interesting point. I, I considered at one point the fact that uh, lower vowels were longer, um, but looking at the ratio, I suppose, between long and short vowels, um, it's not like the ratio between high vowels was much different than low vowels. So durationally, the contrast was very similar, 
but uh, your point of perhaps it's just less time to convey a duration difference, because while the ratio is the same, the actual raw difference in milliseconds is smaller. Um, that's a really great point, and I'm, I probably will have to look at that more. I don't have an answer for you right now. So just to, to follow up on that, the stimuli were based on those natural speech tokens, right, from your speaker? Yeah, yeah. So whatever kind of natural duration difference was there in the vowels, that was kind of amplified with the manipulation, with the duration. Yeah, duration. yeah. So I took um, average, the average of measurements over like different repetitions and different vowels that I'd collected to kind of find a nice average range and based the, the duration range off of that. Um, I made it a little larger than what the actual range was just to, you know, make sure all the possible ranges of duration were kind of in there, but yeah, it's based off of natural productions. Okay. Um, we've got a hand raised here by uh, Nina. Nina, is that a, 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 is that a question? Yes, I had a, had a second question. Um, so at least we've talked about like, um, how these the the cor uh, correlates of the quantity contrast in a region may be even more, or the key, there might be even more cues than what you uh, alluded to here. So one of the things that's been um, investigated is the the effect of the duration of the post vocalic consonant. And I noticed that you had uh, kept it constant, which means that the ratio between the duration of the vowel and the duration of the consonant will differ. Um, but this would be the same for each vowel. So probably this isn't, um, it's the problem per se, but I'm wondering if you think that maybe there actually could be some interaction going on here. Yeah, so um, it, it was a little tricky to try to figure out what to do with that post vocalic consonant duration um, to try to keep it from having an effect on the vowel. Um, I don't think that it would have had that much of an effect on um, the quantity perception to the point that it would have like changed what people were using or the ordering. Um, but it is something that I plan to include in the future, um, like different steps for post vocalic consonant duration as well, just to make sure that we can rule that out as, as not uh, something that's affecting um, the cues that people are picking. And I was wondering, is there a um, reason why I didn't use open syllables? Um, just because there's not like short open syllables. Or sorry, there's no oh, right. of course. syllables, so that was like one of the constraints. Yeah, of course. Yes, good point. Thank you. Okay, so um, we're coming close now to the time. We maybe have uh, time for one more quick question, if there's one out there. Um, otherwise, let's see. Going once, going twice. Okay. Um, all right. So let's thank uh, let's thank Elise for the talk, and uh, with that, we will uh, close this session on uh, phonetics one, uh, part one. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks to the participators. Um, uh, thanks to the participants, the talks, um, the attendees uh, for a great session. Thank you. Session's closing now.